What's up, you guys? Dr. Gooden here in the fourth part of this four-part series on sports psychology, coming from the textbook Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we're at the end of chapter eight from Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, looking at, this time, enhancing motor skill acquisition and learning. So if you've been with me on the last three videos, we've talked all about anxiety and stress and levels of arousal and psychological techniques to control arousal. And now we have to talk about those uh, psychological techniques to enhance motor skill acquisition and learning. This was written, this chapter was written by doctors Statler and Dubois. Let's dive right in. Now the first concept to talk about is whole versus part practice. Whole practice addresses a skill in its entirety. So we'll use Olympic lifting as an example. If you're doing a clean and jerk, you would perform the entire clean and jerk. That's whole practice. Part practice breaks the skill into subcomponents. So we could do this in different ways, through segmentation, which breaks the task into components that have clear breaks between each segment. So maybe we do the clean, we practice cleans, right? A bunch of reps of cleans, and then we go over to the jerk blocks and practice jerks, a bunch of reps of jerks. And those are two very distinct movements within the entire clean and jerk movement, and we practice them separately. That's called segmentation. Fractionalization breaks the task into subcomponents that happen simultaneously. So maybe uh, during the clean, if we call the clean a single movement, uh, I guess we could think of it linearly, right? You have the pull from the floor, the knees sweep back, and then there's a transition to the power position, and the second pull, and then the catch, and then you have to stand up with the load. Those happen sequentially, but we could further break the clean movement down into each of those subcomponents. And furthermore, we could even break each of those subcomponents down into different parts. So maybe we want to work on tension in the low back throughout that clean pull movement. Uh, or maybe we want to work on the knees sweeping back appropriately off the floor. Or maybe we want to work on the transition from uh, the first pull into the second pull uh, or into the power position before the second pull. Those are all different components of the same task that you could break apart and work on uh, separately. Now simplification, uh, this adjusts the difficulty of the task by changing characteristics such as execution speed or the equipment used. So now, maybe during a clean, instead of, uh, instead of performing it at full speed, maybe we perform a halting clean pull where the athlete halts with the bar at the knees and then halts again in the power position before doing the second pull, catching the bar tall, and then doing a front squat. Uh, each of these uh, halting movements or stopping at each of these positions not only increases the motor learning that's happening and it improves the positions the athletes can hit, but it also slows down the movement and allows them to think about where to go before moving there for the next segment of the lift. This is often really useful when you're first teaching people to lift before you start to string together a fluid movement. Now we also have pure part training, which has the athlete practice each subcomponent of a skill multiple times independently. Again, this is where we do all of our cleans and then all of our jerks. Progressive part training has an athlete practice two parts in isolation before practicing them together. So maybe you work on cleans, then you work on jerks, then you work on clean and jerks. After that, we progress from one to the next and then into both. A third component can then be practiced and all three parts can be done together. So if there were three parts to the clean and jerk, or maybe you just do the pull and then you do the, the full clean and then you do the jerk and then you do the full clean and jerk. And then we also have repetitive part training, which has an athlete practice only the first part in isolation, which was the very first example I gave. And then each subsequent part is added until the whole task is reintegrated. So this is kind of like learning a pull from the floor where maybe you do pull to the knees first and then you do, then you add the next component, pull to the knees and then transition to power position. And then you add the next part, which is a, a, the second pull. And then you add the next part, which is turning the bar over and catching it. And then you add the next part, which is front squatting with it. And then you put the whole thing together, right? You started from the floor, you went all the way up and then you do the, the full movement at the end. Now we also have different ways to tweak the practice schedule. 
uh, random practice has an athlete perform multiple skills in random order during a given practice session. So random practice, random order. Variable practice includes variations of the same skill within a single practice session. So let's say the focus of the day is lower body strength and it's gonna be quad dominant or anterior chain dominant. So maybe we do, we start with a back squat and we then go on to a front squat. And then we then add some more volume with a goblet squat. And each of these exercises are different squatting movements, but with slight tweaks in the position and in the load, they're all variations of the same movement. This would be variable practice. And then finally, we have observational learning. This is where an athlete watches pre-recorded videos or live demonstrations. So athletes can improve their skill even when they're not the ones performing that skill through watching film. Now during practice or during training sessions, we have to give instructions as coaches, or we should usually. Um, some, some of us overcoach and give too much instruction, maybe some of us give too little, but it's helpful to know uh, what types of instructions do what for athletes when we're figuring out like what kind of feedback we give them. Explicit instructions include prescriptive information that instructs the athletes about the rules to effectively execute a given task. So this is you know, saying chest up when they're squatting or telling them to screw their feet into the floor when they're squatting or cueing you know, an arched back and scapular retraction during a bench press. Whereas guided discovery provides the athlete with instructions about the overall movement goal. So maybe you show them the movement or you tell them what they need to achieve and then you allow the athlete to accomplish the task in a way that they see fit. You allow them to figure out the optimal method. Now this could be uh, often used probably more for tactical situations, like hey, here's the goal I want you to achieve on the field, you set it up and make it happen. Uh, when you're lifting, if you're, you know, if you're a strength and conditioning coach, you typically wanna give the athletes explicit cues for safety reasons and because we know that there's probably a more optimal or a most optimal way to lift a load for each athlete given the movement that they are performing. Now whereas instructions uh, give the athlete the rules or the overarching goal of a task, feedback is a way to instruct the athlete while they're performing the task or after they're performing. Intrinsic feedback is the athlete's own awareness of their sensory perception feedback uh, from their own ears or their eyes or their uh, you know, proprioception or their sense of feeling or touch. Augmented feedback is feedback provided by an observer, such as a coach or video or laboratory equipment. Now there are two types of augmented feedback we can be giving our athletes. The first is knowledge of results. This is telling the athlete whether or not the movement that they just performed was either good or not so good or somewhere in between. Or maybe know that it wasn't quite there. Instead of doing it this way, we need to do it this other way. So that's, that's knowledge of the actual result. Knowledge of performance is augmented feedback that gives the athlete information about how they achieved the, uh, the movement or how the movement pattern was performed. So if you're talking about a back squat, you could say, well, you know, you back rounded a little bit at, at the bottom, or if you're performing a power clean, uh, well, you starfished a little bit on the catch. Let's instead do it this way. Or, hey, great job not starfishing. You know, you caught it with your legs shoulder width apart, and that's great. So the first is knowledge about whether they did it right or wrong, and the second is uh, feedback about how they performed, and regardless of whether they were right or wrong. The key point, though, is that feedback can be used to facilitate both learning and performance. The timing and frequency of the feedback have different influences on performance and learning. While concurrent feedback is beneficial for competition, delayed feedback that is initially frequent, right? So at first when we're learning movements or when the athletes are new to a type of, of skill, and that decreases with time, will facilitate learning of complex movement patterns. Now that ends part four of our little sports psychology series from chapter eight from the CSCS textbook. Now I'm not really sure which video is gonna come out next, but it should come out in the next several days and it will appear somewhere on the screen. So click over to that video when it appears to continue learning, studying for the CSCS to become a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Now there's a whole playlist with a ton of videos from other chapters and my goal is to eventually get through all of them uh, so that you can use it to study. You can watch them over and over again as you prepare for that test. I've heard from a lot of you saying that these videos are super helpful. So I wanna keep putting them out because I really believe 
in coach education and in getting our strength and conditioning and sport coaches to the highest level of education that's possible and practical so that you can serve your athletes better. I love changing people's lives through movement by allowing them to unlock levels of performance that they didn't know were capable. And for me, the best way to do that is by teaching and mentoring the next generation of coaches, sports scientists, strength and conditioning coaches, and other people who are going into the movement professions. So thanks for staying with me on this video, uh, but don't stop here. Click over to the, next, to the next one when it comes up. And as always, I'm Dr. Gooden. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.